you pray with me? With these same words from Daniel Berry. People my heart, O oh God, with the living. Their cries like fists, their sight healing my eyes for closing night. Would be that one and populous heart of people, O oh cries like fists, O oh sight set free. As you may have caught on, our theme this Lent is fierce love, cultivating steadfast resilience, inspired by yesterday's saints and today's artists. Fierce love. We've talked around it by presenting to you Sojourner Truth, St. Bridget. We have talked about others in our walk. We have talked about the saints in our midst. And yet, I encourage us, as we think about saints like Gattery and Daniel Berrigan and others, what really is that word about? What does that phrase mean to you, fierce love? We began that question this past Wednesday, as Sarah Trail led us in our Wednesday night. Sarah, who runs the sewing, the, the Social Justice Sewing Academy, she had us each make some quilts to answer the question, what is fierce love? The results, miraculously, which emerged from very unartistic hands like myself, were pictures as diverse as a sunrise, as Dulce Nombre de Jesus in Nicaragua, to the steeple of this church with doors wide open, to an eye seeing the ways of our world, to a heart encircling the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., which seems so devoid of love in these days. Fierce love. To you, what does it mean? Is it a person? Is it a feeling? Is it a predisposition? Is it a longing for something that you don't realize? Does it incorporate anger? Does it incorporate peace and reconciliation? This is the question of our Lent. And it remains a question, there are no answers, but there are lived examples of fierce love. The first time I heard this word was out of the mouths of a very ordinary, but extraordinary Presbyterian, a mother named Abby Brockway, who lives in Seattle, who one day decided to build a beautiful artistic creation, a tripod, very high, 20 feet off the ground, which she sat atop, under which was to flow oil trains, bomb trains, as people and the activists that she was with described them. She sat atop that tripod to say no to a world that allows bomb trains to go by elementary schools and playgrounds to not only pollute our atmosphere and warm our climate, but to endanger communities of color which they flow most readily through in our landscape. Abby Brockway promoted fierce love through that kind of advocacy, motivated by her love of Jesus as she was taught through the Presbyterian Church in Seattle. Fierce love, intensity, provocative, yet ultimately an ordinary and deeply conservative I love when Bill McKibben, the co-founder of 350.org, speaks about the climate justice movement. He says it's not a radical movement, it is deeply conservative to preserve our earth for future generations. This is not radical work, it is ultimately very conservative, ordinary work, and we are standing for that which God has given to us. Ordinary people speaking extraordinary things into our world. Today we give thanks to God for a prize-winning poet, an acclaimed Broadway playwright, a best-selling memorist, a theologian, a professor, an actor, a social critic, a radical resistor, a rebel Jesuit priest, a fugitive, an ex-con, a Nobel Peace, Peace Prize nominee, and in the words of Amy Goodman from Democracy Now!, a national treasure, Daniel Berrigan. Last year's New York Times obituary <coughs> described Daniel Berrigan this way, an intellectual star of the Roman Catholic New Left, 
articulating a view that racism and poverty, militarism and capitalistic greed were interconnected pieces of the same big problem, an unjust society. Father Berrigan left this earth at the age of 94, less than a year ago, embodied fierce love in his very veins. How shall we educate people to goodness, to a sense of one another, to a love of the truth, he said, but more urgently, how shall we do this in a bad time? He knew bad times. He wrote this in 1971 while imprisoned for protesting the Vietnam War. Paul Simon wrote, it, wrote about him in that song, Me and Julio Down by the Schoolyard, when the radical priests come to get him released. He's all on the cover of Newsweek. Daniel Berrigan and his brother Philip stood powerfully in opposition to the ways of war. He wrote, one is called to live nonviolently, even when that change seems impossible. I wonder what dear Daniel would say about our world today. A persistent hope that Bob boiled up from the very heart of this man on all accounts was infectious. I was first introduced to Berrigan through two second-hand sources. I never met him like Harry Forsdick did in a Battelle Chapel at Yale University. I never had that honor, but Reverend John Deere, also a very radical peacemaker inspired by Jesus in our world, wrote an incredible book about his essential writings. And so did a dear friend of mine who is a Quaker chaplain at Harvard University, John Bach, who first met Daniel Berrigan when he was 18 years old, when John Bach was 18 years old and locked away for three years for avoiding and resisting the draft to Vietnam. He met Daniel in jail there in Danbury, Connecticut, and his life was changed. He went from a, a life of anger to a life of love and dedicated himself to the ways of the Quaker peace movement throughout his life. Daniel Berrigan, a poet of peace, a prophet of peace, a peacemaker at the work in the belly of the American empire, John Deere writes. Dan knew it at his heart that God does not bless war or justify it or create it. There are no accounts of which God can stand for such things. God calls us to love enemies, not to kill them. God commands us to take up the cross of nonviolent resistance to empire, not put others on cross. By this humble yet active life, Berrigan offered an affirming yes to a God of life and peace. He was born in 1921 and grew up just like Sojourner Truth and St. Gattery, Tecatuita, just a few hundred miles from here in the landscape of New York State. He entered the religious life, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, in 1939, three weeks before World War II began. That context drove him in his life toward becoming a peacemaker. He studied here at Weston Jesuit in Boston for a little bit and was ordained in 1952. He was close with Dorothy Day, who said of him, Thank God, Daniel, you are truly bearing the cross, giving your life for others. Dedicated to justice for others, especially the marginalized, Berrigan traveled with many others to Selma. He traveled to South Africa during the apartheid regime. He went to Vietnam to release POWs and minister to AIDS patients in the heart of New York City, co-founding the Catholic Peace Fellowship. Now, unlike St. Catherine, who had only a few known attributed words because she was Mohawk, because she died at the age of 24, because she was a woman, Daniel Berrigan, a white male, we have volumes of quotes to choose from and to be inspired by. So when we think about the saints that we chose this Lent, did we choose him because of the color of his skin, we ask? No. Maybe we did, actually. Yes, maybe we did choose him because he is a white man, the first white man saint that we're celebrating in this Lenten season. Daniel Berrigan looked at the privilege he was given because of his white, si white skin, turned away from its sin, and said, I am going to represent a different version of what it means to be a white Catholic male in the United States, and he resisted that constructed me that we learned about yesterday in this beautiful racial justice training as a church. He resisted that construct and said, God's realm, God's sovereignty widely opens us to a different way of being. At his core, he was someone who loved Jesus and spent time seeing Christ in all. As our beautiful quote goes, the beauty, the tragic beauty 
of the face of Christ, which, sign, which shines in all our faces. Christ, babbler of the street and hedgerow. Even though the beauty of that face of Christ is so rarely seen in our world, and so rarely seen in the face of the marginalized, that we often walk by in those streets, along those hedgerows. Our gospel reading speaks about that not seen. It's not a story of physical blindness. It's not a story about sin. It's a story of societal blindness. The process a society finds its clarity through the muddy, gritty, messy actions of peacemaking. Just like that mud that Jesus places on the eyes of the one born blind in the story so well read by many. From the Gospel of John. For in restoring sight to this man regulated to the roadside begging, Jesus moves from healer to disruptor. As soon as this former beggar receives his sight, the inequalities of the community are brought to light. The injustices that led that blind person to be regulated to the roadside becomes very clear. When questioned by those skeptics around him, this newly liberated beggar in the story says, I don't know the details about this Jesus or what happened to me or what sin is all about. One thing I do know, and that I was blind, and now I see. Amazing grace. That liberated, marginalized one who sees the threat to the powers that be and recognizes that. For in the liberation of this man, Jesus not only confounds a community, he condemns a flawed, systemic sin that associates physical ability and sin. In first century Palestine, of course, you remember there was the only disagreements about sin and physical ailments were who sinned, the person or their parents. Jesus artfully and forcefully decouples this association, makes it clear it's not about sin, and Jesus says the situation has unfolded as an opportunity for the rest of us to readjust our positions and to make space and to learn compassion. The community will now need to make room for this roadside beggar, no longer on the street, but at the table. They will need to share their resources more equitably as they can no longer walk by him unseeing. And in so doing, the story implies the social sight of the community will be restored through that messy, gritty process of nonviolent love. Daniel Berrigan said that peacemaking is tough, unfinished, and blood-ridden. There is a deep cost to becoming peacemakers. And the outcome is better, is in better hands than our own. The focus is not the God of peace, the God of peace has for us, is not on the ends, but the process itself. As this story from John does not end with resolution for the community, in fact, they drive the formerly blind man out in continued disbelief and judgment. And they refuse to see Jesus as a healer from God, but rather as a sinner and rule breaker. See, what gets them so upset is not that Jesus is healed, but Jesus is healed on the Sabbath. He has broken the law for the sake of a higher law of liberation and education, Jesus' sin here, as interpreted by the critics, are that he crossed the line. Jesus becomes a felon for the sake of the higher gospel law. Similar to St. Barry, who in 1968, with fellow peacemaker, his brother, Philip, stole and burned draft files with homemade napalm in Baltimore as part of the Catonsville Nine, and this act landed them in jail, following a time in which Daniel escaped the FBI as a fugitive. Our apologies, good friends, he wrote, for the fracture of good order, for the burning of paper instead of the burning of children. We could not, so help us God, do otherwise. Folk singer Dar Williams wrote about this radical priest and said, I had no right to do this but for the love of God. Yes, I broke the law, but God calls me to a higher law. He was motivated his whole life, in which he was arrested for hundreds of different times, barely a year in his adult life in which he was not arrested. He was motivated by the love of God, by a higher law to disrupt civil laws. 1980, we recall, he hammered an unarmed nuclear warhead, telling the judge, 
there, they were simply trying to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy to beat swords into plowshares. <laughs> Creative, humorous, law-breaking nonviolence, constantly holding aloft the gospel vision of love and peace with justice, and hopeful for a new order of gentleness and loving kindness. Berrigan took to heart Martin Luther King's words. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. So fellow Lentonites, what laws might we be called to disobey in these troubling days? Might they be laws that violate and disrupt the lives of immigrants who our God tells us to radically welcome? Might it be to violate laws that are violating our earth and her climate in favor of lining the wallets of the fossil fuel company holders and lining our landscape with filthy, dangerous pipelines? Might it be to violate the God-given rights that are being taken away from our transgendered youth? To violate the laws that are being taken away by the rights of our transgendered youth? Or might it be to violate the laws that are being lifted to ban or marginalize entire groups of people who happen to worship a God with a slightly different name. Friends, not all of us are called to jail, but many of us in these days, in these new days, are called to a higher law and which may require a new intense civil disobedience in these days. I wonder, too, if we're called to a new social disobedience to break some societal laws in these days. Berrigan wrote about the love of enemies. It's a strange command when you think of it, love and then enemies. The two cannot coexist. They're like fire and ice in the hand. The fire melts the ice, and the ice extinguishes the fire. The fire wins out, at least in the gospel text, he writes. The verb love transforms the noun enemies. The enemy is reborn by the power of love, astonishing. Now the enemy is a former enemy, a present friend, a brother, a sister, lover, even. Talk about rebirth. Love you, the enemy, and lo, the enemy vanishes. Also, it's not only the opponent who undergoes a dazzling transformation, but myself as well, who against all expectation has learned love in place of hatred, who had once been stuck in the same plight as my enemy, Christ commends and confers a mutual rebirth. Our society tells us to fear and to hate, to even have enemies, and Jesus calls us to a new social order, to love and to convert ourselves and our so-called enemies. John Deere, when he first met Daniel Berrigan in 1984, asked him for some advice. Berrigan told him, make your story fit into the story of Jesus. Ask yourself, does your life make sense in the light of Christ? All we have to do is close our eyes to the culture and open them to our friends. We have enough to go on, and we can't afford the luxury of despair. The best way to be hopeful is to do hopeful things. Thank you, St. Berrigan. Do hopeful things. Fit your life into the life of Jesus. Press on with the long view toward resurrection. Berrigan also talked about the Bible giving us a long view rather than the expectation of a quick fix. He wrote, all of us are in grave danger of being infected by this American ethos that good work brings quick change rather than the older spiritual notion that good work is its own justification and that the outcome is in other hands beside ours. Friends, we as Lentonites, as followers of Christ, as longers, longing for peace, as people who make peace in our bodies, in our prayers, in our congregations, in our families, in our friendships, we need to align ourselves with a God who calls us not to look at the end, but to remember the long journey of justice and the road to walk forward in hope and not despair. Despair, as Daniel wrote, is a luxury and a distraction. You shall not kill. You shall not kill.
I have longed to say more beautiful things, but I am frustrated that all I have been able to say to my fellow humans is stop killing, Daniel said. May we, friends, be part of the other things that Daniel longed to say, and we know he did in his beautiful poetry and artistic renditions of this world. May we be part of the beautiful tapestry that God is calling us to be. I'm so impressed by Sarah Trail, who took unartistic people like myself and helped us create beautiful quilt squares that she and others are going to then sew into a beautiful blanket, showing the community and the warmth that can come from the, our own artistic self-expression and our own renditions of fierce love. We are all called to be that art for the world. May we be artists inspired by those gone before and those who are coming after us, whom we steward in our faith and in our love of Christ. May we be like Berrigan, who woke up every morning and dedicated himself to hours of Bible reading and prayer before he even walked then for miles in his community, long before he dedicated himself to civil disobedience and justice work. Friends, falling in love again with the God who loves us is at the core of our Lenten message. May we be those peacemakers of love, inspired by people like Berrigan and the blind beggar who so fiercely loved and taught the world what it means to see again. We pray this in Christ's name. very good friends was someone named Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger, if you do not know that name, was also a peacemaker in our world, lived into his 90s as well, and gave this world a lot of beauty and challenged us to the ways of peace. Today we're going to sing one of Pete's songs that Daniel sang many a times. If I had a hammer, it's in your bulletin, we invite you to sing along together as a group. 